we know as folks who are taking care of small ones that uh, during the day, it's really difficult uh, to get away. I found that, that so many people are telling me about how, how busy they are, um, despite the fact that you know, the majority of us are at home. And it's, it's such a stressful, but also opportune time. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about all the stresses and all the opportunities today. And we have a very, very talented and very experienced panel here to talk with me through some of these issues with you. Um, today we have Laura Perrette, who, as David said, is a child psychologist, and also Raquel Kumba, who's a child psychologist here at Union Square Practice. Um, both Laura, welcome Laura and welcome Raquel. Um, Laura and Raquel have extensive experience and expertise um, at working with kids of all ages, uh, especially with regard to a, a technique uh, and style of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a style of therapy that many of you are familiar with that really provides concrete strategies and tools for helping kids and, and people of all ages really overcome anxiety and depression. And now is a time where those tools are really going to be helpful for all of us, uh, all parents here who are listening. So welcome, guys. Thank Hello. you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for making the time to come this evening. We really appreciate and are excited to talk with you. I'm glad you brought that up, um, you know, because it's, uh, it's such a hard time to make time. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, for all the parents that are listening, as Laura's saying, it's excellent that you guys are making the time to do this. Um, because it's easy to just kind of get in the swing of things and handle things as they come. But taking this proactive approach to listen to a few experts uh, talk about this is really a great step. Um, so, you know, talking to you guys, you know, you, you're talking to tons of parents um, and tons of kids. What, what are the things that you're, you're hearing from these days? What, what comes up mostly in conversations that you're, that you're having with parents and kids these days? I'd say it's, it's been a range. Um some from the initial adjustment of just to the news and sort of waiting to hear what was gonna happen with everyone's different family members' jobs, um, to adjusting to online schooling, to now as we're nearing the end of the school year, how that's impacting everyone and thinking about summer camps and everything um, that would a family would typically encounter throughout the year. Yeah has been a really big theme as well, just kind of not knowing about timelines on things, including you know whether school will be back in or not um, before the end of the year, um, and just how students and parents are responding to that as they navigate um, going forward in this challenging time. Yeah, uncertainty is, is to me, I think the, the headline, right, of what people are experiencing, not knowing what's coming next and having this changing environment, which we all know, all parents who are listening, that. Kids don't do very well with that. That's a challenge. Uncertainty for kids, um, they crave certainty. And you know, as, as, as Laura and, and uh, Raquel are talking, you know, one of the things I'd like to ask all the parents here is, you know, to, we'd like to hear what the things are that your kids are, are faced with. Um, you know, we're hearing a little bit about uncertainty as Laura's talking about, but we're curious. And if you want to put in the chat box, you know, one thing that your kid is doing, saying that's on your mind, um, it'll be helpful for us to think about as we go through. Later on, uh, David, who's running the whole show here, thank you, David, again, um, is going to you know, find a few questions that people have. And we're gonna to try to answer your questions directly. One of the benefits of a webinar, unlike any other kind of podcast or, or video that we might make, is you have a real chance to ask us questions directly about particular things that are happening with your parenting experience. So you know, back to you guys. Um, wh so what, what are ways that, that parents can can talk through that uncertainty to kids? What's important for parents to think about in that discussion? I think um, acknowledging the uncertainty and all the feelings that that brings up is really important. Making space for that might sound simple or obvious, but with so much going on in adults' lives regarding their work, their family, um, how to take care of everyone, as well as the bills and just all the responsibilities, um, it can be hard to remember that the little ones in your life also need that full um, attention and space to really process their own um, challenges as they see it for their current life. We know in some ways the novelty has worn off, some young people, you know, found this exciting or, um, you know, noticed how much more time they were getting to spend with the family pet or with their parents, their sibs. I know my own dog has just been 
loving this, um, just, you know, people and humans all around all the time. So I think one thing that parents are just really um, thinking about is what they can do to support their kids. And I would say that giving space to process feelings um, and a, a few strategies around that. Kids, um, we know all really vary in their personality, their temperament. Um, and so it might be helpful depending on their age and stage and their personality style to not talk with your kids in the same way or even at the same time. Checking in with them individually, giving them each one-to-one -one attention, um, having fun with them as well as hearing them out are all gonna be really key strategies to continue doing, um, especially as time, as time goes on because for some folks, they might have really made that space at the beginning, um, and now is a really good time to check in, especially with school being canceled uh, for the rest of the year in person, um, and as well as summer plans up in the air. There's, there's no, I, I love that. I mean, I think, you know, when we when this first went down, we had a family meeting where we all came into the living room and sat down and talked about it. But I think it's great advice, actually, what you're saying is just even now, even in the midst of this, making sure that that if you have more than one kid, that they have the time and space to talk about their particular view of it. And then also I think you're saying too is, you know, find the time with your kid, make some time um, that you have a chance to actually put, get them in a space where they're really comfortable to talk about it and allow for feelings that you might not know that are there. How would you, how would you guys open that conversation? Uh, you know, talk us through it. What, what would you say that parents should say to kids to, to open a conversation like that? I think it's important to to ask to ask a question. Start with the question. I wonder what's been on your mind lately. Kind of what Laura alluded to is just acknowledging what's happening and then leaving it up with a question. You know, so what's been on your mind? I know the end of the year is coming. I camp is around the corner. I'm wondering if you have any questions. I think the best thing that we can do again, keeping in mind the age of our children, is what's important to them and some of them might have a lot of questions and some of them might not have any questions and might feel at peace with what's going on at the moment so I think the best we can do is not um, plant more anxieties or unneeded anxieties in their world and so let them lead the conversation as much as they can and I think that's more so for our younger ones our teens tweens and older ones obviously have access to a lot of information so they might have a lot more to question a lot more to comment on and I think it's also our opportunity to, to clarify some of those misconceptions or myths um, related to any of those topics. Yeah what, what are some of the misconceptions that you're hearing or the things that some of the things that kids are dealing with that are incorrect or some of the worries that that they have particular worries? Well I think some of them are true which is like worrying about um, recently I was talking to one adolescent who is concerned about their grandparent moving into the house that they're staying at and having a worry about like well what's going to happen if they come and live with us I, I, I couldn't handle if something happened and it's blaming themselves essentially if something were to happen to that elder grandparent and so part of it is acknowledging right that worry and recognizing that there are things that we can do to control and manage some of those worries so it gets back to the original conversation, the ongoing conversation of dealing with COVID, right? So we can wash our hands, we can use hand sanitizers, wearing our masks. We will, you know, whether someone's staying in a certain part of the home versus another part of the home. Um, I think that's been another way for us to help families manage too, reminding them of what it is that they can control. Yeah, well, well I like what you're saying, Raquel, is that I, I think fundamentally what we try to do with our kids is to fix it. Um, and that there's some things that can be fixed strategically, but a lot of what's happening here with uncertainty, um, you know, can't uh, be fixed. And so finding a way to just validate kids um, and show them that you understand, to empathize and show them that you understand their emotion uh, behind it. I think another point is um, it can feel like worries can just take over and that they can feel kind of unmanageable or overwhelming without some of those strategies that uh, my colleagues have already been discussing. One that I really um, enjoy and encourage families to use is having a specific time to worry, which maybe sounds a little strange, but what that can actually do is kind of give a sense of control to all the 
other times so that it doesn't feel like you're worrying all the time and you can redirect your child. You know, let's talk about that when we sit down and just have our reflection period or the time where we air things out. And in that way, you're really giving them a tool to notice when their, their mind is carrying them away and redirect them to focus on something more at hand or something a little bit um, more enjoyable. Yeah, that's great. So just, you know, quarantining the worry is what you're saying, right? Finding a place to say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna quarantine that worry to this part of the day," um, and then that way, I think that also your your technique helps a lot with folks who are in a situation where kids are repeating their worry over and over again, um, or worrying multiple times a day. Because um, you know what I found is I'm not sure what you guys think about this, but it's kind of impossible to insulate kids to all the information. I mean, it's just sort of everywhere, and you know I think that idea is helpful because even if it if the worry gets sparked. You can say we're gonna we're gonna do that at our, our worry time or our reflection time. You know, you guys spoke a little bit about um, kids of different ages, and I'm wondering, you know, how when you're thinking about that developmentally, because we have people who are logged on here who have kids of all different ages. Um, you know, I'm wondering what what have you seen there, and, and what are your thoughts about developmentally how this changes if you have a small kid or a school age kid or a teenager. Well, I, I would say certainly for, for our zero, zero to two, two, three crowd, <laughs> where they haven't quite developed language. The big, the big, the big partiers. The big, yes, huge partiers. They love to stay up. <laughs> um, for those, for those little ones, I would say obviously, you know, they're still working on language development. It hasn't quite been verbalized um, to us yet. So for them, it's super important to maintain that consistent routine that I'm hoping most of Pair of our parents, caretakers have heard that, especially when this first thing all started, that that was the key to a lot of this and remains a key. Um, and then for our three to five little ones who have developed language, I think it's really important to use as simplified language as possible. Um, they don't need to be bombarded with details in the way that you would speak to, I would say, tweens and adolescents, where you can have more of a conversation with them. Um, but just Broadly speaking, that's the approach that I, I would keep in mind across most of these conversations. It can really help to ask the young person as well what they already know or understand about the situations. That gives them um, a way to voice what maybe they've been keeping inside or what they don't understand and also gives you a way to that how much information you should be providing. Because as Raquel said, um, depending on the age and stage, but also the verbal ability, the inclination, the curiosity, the anxiety level, all sorts of factors really affect how much information kids benefit from. And I think opening up the conversation with what they already know or understand or misunderstand about the situation can be useful orientation to the topic. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the points you're making is that, you know, oftentimes we don't know what our kids are hearing. Um, and so asking them about, which is really important, asking them, well, what, what have you heard so far? Um, what are the things that you're getting? And that, you know, most kids are online, um, doing online learning and learning about this from other ways. So understanding what kids are, what have they heard about what's going on can be really helpful. We have a, a question about that, actually. Um, from uh, from someone on our, our chat here and yeah just to encourage you guys um, you know just finding ways to um, ask your own question um, would be great um, because we get a lot of um, important questions from people who are actually facing things with their kids um, and each family is different and we're all facing this in different ways we have the same challenge but it, it manifests in different ways in each of our households um, one of the questions here I, I want to post to you guys is about uh, is about screen time and and using screens and I know we were going to talk about that anyway but um, you know so someone here has asked I've noticed an increase in mood swings in my children specifically when computers or TV is taken away unfortunately they need to be on computers multiple times a day in class how can we manage that so you know what are, you, what are your thoughts there guys it's really hard it, it, I'll just open it, the discussion with it's so so hard because online learning 
social connection through friends with family it's all moved to the digital world and so we we're also noticing even in our own lives for work um, or maintaining the relationships we need to maintain that screens are so so key so what we're modeling in terms of the kind of time on and time off screens is something we should really look at and think about and help our kids and, and families think through how to set boundaries because even though it seems like maybe we need to be on screens all the time for everything that isn't actually true and new research is pointing to um, you know what we all suspected that being on screens all day does really affect mood negatively it doesn't feel the same um, we wish it did but it's it's not exactly the same as in real life connection there's a subtle delay there's increased self-consciousness especially for kids that are more anxious or hesitant to speak out um, seeing what they look like and, and how that interacts in the classroom with their teachers um, and with friends and family it can all be really difficult to navigate so to bring it down to kind of what we would suggest uh, regarding screens is setting boundaries both physical um, and and kind of modeling uh, boundaries with time and space. So um, no matter what space you're using for school or for work, there can be areas or times designated that I would encourage you to collaboratively agree on are screen free. Some easy low hanging fruit might be meals. It might be, um, you know, certainly in the hour before bed, um, you know, sleep hygiene is really encouraged to be a screen free um, practice. And um, just keeping in mind again that you know, certain spaces, certain times, as much as you can, having boundaries. Um, I also think there's a lot of wonderful apps that parents can use to help monitor screen use. Um, I think being transparent and collaborative is the way to go there again. Um, and, and especially with teens having a discussion if, if it's becoming a problem. Um, and just one last thing I'll circle back on is really being mindful of what you're modeling because um, that's really, it's really important. Yeah, it's such a struggle because, you know, I think, you know, the, the real, I think what one of, at the heart of what you're saying also, it's, it's showing our kids what we like them to do. So, you know, being able to take, even just, I think what you're saying too, what I've found is just taking some screen breaks, um, you know, during the workday even where possible, that demonstrates a model to our kids. Um, you know, we've got some really great questions here. So I just want to open up and, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging David, maybe you want to check in with folks to see who's, who's able to, who wants to answer these live um, or ask these live. But, um, you know, there's a couple really great questions. You know, one person was asking about, um, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll read you uh, one of the, the questions here that someone asked, which is, you know, what, how do we help or speak to kids who want to isolate themselves from their family? What do you guys think about that? I think that's a great question. And I think it, it kind of piggies back off what Laura was saying, right? If, if we continue building off those routines and schedules, then naturally if we've worked on sort of let's come together as a family and have dinner, then that's a natural meeting point when everyone can sort of have that family time. And with that question, I was wondering like, what's the age of the child, right? Because if, if it's a younger child, I might be more concerned if something else is happening. If you were to tell me it's an adolescent, I might be like, well, you know, it's a period in their life where they're going to want a bit more time to themselves. And also, depending on what your family arrangement is during this pandemic, remember that we all want a little one-on-one -on -one time with ourselves when we can get it. So just being mindful of that. I, I would continue to monitor that. I mean, you can also get creative, right? Like, so I think I liked what you mentioned at the beginning, Jonathan, that you and your family had a family meeting, right? So I think get creative. I've also like communicate, like, what can we do? Like, what can be fun? What are some of the things that we've been wanting to do together as a family, but maybe just haven't had the time that this is now naturally creating in ways that it hasn't before. So whether that's game night, like get their input, what is it that they would want to see happen as opposed to impose our ideas on them too, making it as collaborative as possible yeah I mean I think yeah. to your point, Raquel and, and even what Laura what you were saying before about modeling I mean I think the, the, pan, the point of having the family meeting too is just to give kids a sense that we're doing something we're not going to solve all this but we're being proactive and also that you know we're, we're showing we're showing our kids that we're struggling with it too but in a way that's responsible and protecting them um, so I think you know that that modeling piece kind of back to what Laura was saying 
is a way to to find creative ways to do this. Um, you know, I'm wondering about you know going back to the screen use thing while we're thinking about who's going to ask a question here. But is when you when you when you think about screen use, what are some of the other things that that parents can do in that situation? What, um, I, what I wanted to add to that actually was, and what I've been talking to a lot with my my adolescents, and is just physical breaks, like, like, not just like, let me get up and walk around, but actually, like, if you have a long enough period, can I go for a jog, socially distance with the mask, whatever you need to do, of course, um, or can I, is this a moment to, like, do push-ups, or can I just do jumping jacks in my house, because I think it, exercise just covers so many areas, right, like, it helps to re release some of that physical energy, pent-up energy, it helps to sort of rebalance our emotions, clear our mind in a different way. So I think if we've been staring at a screen, not only do we get to move, but just be in a different way that I think it will help to refocus refocus us and take in information in, in a way that we might not have otherwise. In particular, I would say for those who are working on those longer essays that they, they need to tackle, I think it's become especially challenging for, for my students who are working on that. Um, so that's a way to kind of, we've been playing around with that and to reboot. Don't forget the exercise. Yeah, so, and, I'll, and I think what you're saying is build that into a routine. Mm -hmm. So be able to build that into the routine so that people are doing that and even parents can do it with kids. Yeah. You know, um, there's, there's been a couple questions in the, in the chat here that I, I, really, um, I really relate to and that I, I think a lot of parents are struggling with, which is this idea of how do we as parents um, stay positive, right? So, you know, I think, the, the plus side to this is that we're all spending so much quality time with our kids. Um, mm -hmm. And me personally, I'm loving that. Um, but the idea of now being, you know, teacher and parent and, you know, I think people are getting stressed about that. And the idea, for example, of, oh, what if, you know, we think towards next year that some kids might be with us um, into the, into the fall. And so I'm just curious about what your guys' thoughts are. I mean, I have some ideas, but I'm, I'm curious from a, from a child psychology perspective. What, what can parents do to keep themselves positive? That was a question that someone asked there. I think uh, self-compassion goes a really long way. Um, so it might not always be possible to stay positive, and it might actually be really important um, to the, you know, the children in your life to show um, not the the um, details of your concerns, you know, certainly young children don't want to, you know, worry about the economics or the health in the same way that adults are capable of. But I think when we talk about staying positive, it's also important to stay kind and to stay um, authentic with that because this is, um, you know, for lack of better way to put it, it really is an unprecedented time. I know that's been all around us, um, but nobody has, you know, the, the playbook on how to manage this all the time in every situation that comes up at home or with work. Um, and our colleague, a couple of weeks ago did um, a really wonderful job talking about mindful parenting, which is being aware and non-judgmental towards one's own um, perceived kind of experience of parenting. Um, when asking about staying positive, I think a lot of the strategies that we're suggesting for kids really work well for adults too. Using self-talk to notice if you're getting to a place where um, some thinking traps are in play. We know common thinking traps that are especially, um, you know, in some ways realistic right now are kind of um, the uncertainty, the potentially seeing everything as a catastrophe, you know, and noticing when we're going down um, that spiral and saving it for worry time for later, talking about it in supportive relationships, um, journaling, validating oneself, seeking validation from others, um, and really um, kind of, you know, something that we're trying to hit on throughout this talk is promoting resilience. And we know that the way to stay positive or resilient is to you know foster our connections and our sense of wellness um, and to really find as much meaning and, and healthy thinking strategies as we can. So as Raquel was saying, you know, self-expression, movement, these are all really important outlets that I know, you know, um, have been encouraged throughout the media and what we might be reading or seeking out, but the, the importance really can't be overstated. These are the core tenets of how to care. Um, for yourself so that you can care for your, your, um, for the young people around you. 
Very much agree, Laura. Um, I think it's, it's a challenging time. I think I would add for parents a, a couple of things, it, very much on key with what you were saying about self-compassion, right? It's, it's give yourself the room, right? You, you need time for yourself too, and that's okay. I think it's, it's super important to take that time when you can find it, even if it's five minutes that are sprinkled throughout your day is really important. Related to that piece of connection, I think it's important to acknowledge that whether you are a single parent, two parent household, whether you're with grandparents, you, you don't have the full access to your resource and community as you once had it, right? Like the teachers that would take your children, the daycare at which you would drop off your kids, that is not at your, at your fingertips anymore. And that is, it's real. The stress that you're feeling is very real. And sort of, I'm, I'm hoping that families have come to a place of sort of settling into routine as best as they can. Um, and with that, acknowledging by way of being human, there might still be moments where things don't go as, you know, rainbows and unicorns because we're living real life. And I think that's also an opportunity that we also speak to parents about that we can model through that too, right? So if we have an angry moment, we can speak to that. It's an opportunity to come back to our child, to acknowledge that, to apologize and speak to it. Um, this might be sort of odd, but I've been wa rewatching The Sopranos. So I think if, if Tony Soprano can apologize to his child over pizza, then, then you can too, <laughs> right? So it's an opportunity to acknowledge that moment and have a conversation and be human, be human with each other around that. Absolutely. I mean, I think we can distill some excellent parenting moments from the Sopranos, <laughs> just in general. I think, Raquel, you know, what you're saying is so, such a great take on, which is number one, we can, the, the best thing about, I mean, I think there's such learning opportunities by saying you're sorry to your kid um, and explaining why you're sorry. And I think that coupled with Laura's idea about, you know, just focusing on self-compassion, really, um, you know, being able to just you know, allow ourselves, or just avoid shame and judgment of ourselves in these moments um, and accept the moments just as they are um, is a practice that can be helpful. We have a, a couple people that are happy to ask some questions live. Um, so I think we're going to, um, you're getting a lot of love, by the way, on the Tony Soprano reference. There's a, the chat box is lighting on fire. It's a great show. A lot, a lot, it is a great show. It is a great show. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of Sopranos fans on here. So we have a question from, oh, my friend Kristen Lynch. Let's see if we can, um, I think we can uh, bring Kristen up here. Hello, do you hear Kristen. me? Kristen. Feeder, Dr. We can Feeder. Hear you. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. And you have a question for us. What a, what a party. Thank you. Thank hey, you guys, just so you know, this may be a Sopranos related question. I just got, you know, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. It's so not Sopranos related. Although I'm feeling, I, I, I've had moments of feeling very Carmela over this quarantine. <laughs> Haven't we all? Wow, this is like turning into like Unisquare practice. <laughs> we're, we're turning into like a Sopranos themed, uh, themed call here. Kristen, lay it on us. What are you thinking about? So I had a question pertaining to um, cultivating hope with so much uncertainty. So one of the things that might kids have been asking, and, and I have a 12 year old and a 17 year old is, when is this going to end? I need a date. When, when can we go back to normal? When can I see my boyfriend? When can I see my friends? And, um, you know, initially, there was some ease, but it's getting more intense, not knowing when, and sort of not being able to give a timeline. Um, so I'm curious to know how we can cultivate hope when we really don't have any time when we, short time when we know we'll be back to some sort of normalcy and be able to reconnect with the people we love outside of our family members. Such a great question. Um, such a, a really great question. And I'm, I'm really glad that you asked it, Kristen, because I think what we hope, what we hope people come away from this outside of a comprehensive new knowledge about the Sopranos um, is a sense of how to, how to, how to um, find hope and positive solutions to what they're dealing with. So what do you guys think, Laura, Raquel, like what, what comes to mind about Kristen's question? I think it's very much acknowledging where we're at. That's, that's come up with a couple of my adolescents as well. Um, I 
think it's it's getting back a couple i would say a couple pieces right so what what is it that we can be grateful in this more moment sort of bringing their minds to the present moment in this very moment what is it that you're grateful for and that's something else that we've also talked about sort of sprinkling more on a daily basis i think now more so than ever the other aspect of it is since they are adolescents i mean following the news like you communicating to them if they're not aware of it, like what are, right? Like when was always talking about the facts and the statistics and what is it that we're looking for? So they can receive that information that's more meaningful to them than someone who's younger. Um, and, but what another piece that we haven't said is also like, we, we don't, we don't know and it's okay to say that as well. And then sort of leaning in on the other two points that I just mentioned as, as well, right? We're gonna do the best that we can to get information that we do have access to and get it back to our kids. But in the meantime, I think it's building on that. I've had another adolescent, you mentioned a boyfriend, um, where the two families did troubleshoot that. They did get the two the pair <laughs> to, to see each other. So you might find yourself like, maybe that's something you not, may not have communicated as often with you know your child's boyfriend, parents, or whoever it may be. But maybe that's something that's happening now. And, and now you're going to figure out, all right, like who's asking the appropriate questions, right? Like, is everybody, you know, healthy? If that's something that feels safe to you, of course, that's, I think that's family dependent, but I did have one family with teens who did, did do that. Um, but I think it's, it's speaking to like that feeling of uneasiness. We're all a little bit uneasy in this and it gets back to some of the key markers that we pointed out too. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the only thing I would add to what you're saying, Raquel, too, is I, I think this goes back to what Laura was saying, actually, which is about modeling, too, that I think one of the things that happens for me is when my kids are hopeless, um, I try to push them towards hope um, versus just speaking kind of out into the air about hope um, and what I'm hopeful for and how I'm hoping these things were happening, because I've caught myself um, you know, many times worrying out loud. And so to be able to catch yourself doing that and say, you know what, like, here's what's going to happen. Um, you know, I, uh, what I, what I've realized too, is I, I, I also think about it in this way that one of the ways to explain it, I think to kids is, you know, when it's like the holidays, it's Christmas, it's your birthday and you spend every day thinking about it. Like, I can't wait for my birthday to come. I can't, it makes that feeling feel longer. It's harder to hope uh, versus if you just direct your attention to what you're doing. And so I think that that can be helpful too, is to think about other things, other situations in which they've been hopeful or hoping for something and it eventually, it eventually got there. So I think, you know, those are a couple things that, that come to mind. But I think more than everything, what we're saying is, you know, it's a real struggle. And to be able to, you know, acknowledge that it's a struggle for all of us to maintain hope um, and to ask kids about, what what they're feeling and to show and to validate you know briefly before we go on to the other question i know you guys do that a lot how how can parents validate uh, you know uh, hopelessness what what can they what take talk us through what you know you would say a, a parent should say to a kid about because i know you you've talked a lot about before and um, how does that process work in terms of validating uh, feeling it's a really important skill and one that um you know, when we see our kids in pain or having strong feelings, it's a really natural parenting instinct to want to comfort, to want to reassure, to want to make it better, different. And unfortunately, in this situation, we don't have the power to do that. I love the idea of saying, you know, is there any anything that you feel like we could do? You know, do you have any ideas? Um, you know, let's hear your kids out on that, but it might not be feasible for whatever reason. And so, you know, a tool that you always have no matter what, and it doesn't even mean that you agree with how your young person is feeling. All you're really saying is parroting back what you're observing in them. So for example, validating, you know, the, how the 12 and the 17 year old might be feeling, it might be something as simple as you really want to see your boyfriend it's impossible to you that you have no idea when you'll get to see him again. That's validating the feeling and it's not reassuring by saying, oh, it'll be okay or we'll get there soon. It's really just acknowledging how hard it is by reflecting back the experience that they're having. And young people, um, humans in general, doesn't matter the age, really feel contained, safe and understood when their concerns are validated. So it's something that I, I can't encourage parents enough. It's really important to be doing right now. 
Sopranos level advice, guys, from Dr. Kumba and Dr. Perret right here. Um, you know, we have a, another live question from uh, a friend, Ayla, uh, who I believe has a question about her six-year-old and four-year-old. Welcome, Ayla. Hello. Welcome. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so my question, um, I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old, um, and they have been fighting nonstop. Um, and I'm finding that the only time that I can get them to stop is if I say I'll take something away from them. Um, and I really don't want to be doing that all the time. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas of how to increase the likelihood that they'll play nicer together um, or any ideas of how to get them to listen without, you know, threatening to take something away. This just shouts behavior plan to me. I can't resist thinking about how I would want to engage them in thinking about ways that they're going to play a new game, which is toys that they can only use together, for example, or some other positive spin on that would incentivize them to get along. I think it's, it's two sides of the same coin. So when you're seeing something that you don't want to see, like siblings fighting and taking something away, the other side of that coin is when you see them doing what you want them to be doing, rewarding, praising, incentivizing, um, however that looks best to the four and six-year-olds, whatever treat it is that they might be able to um, embrace together, I would really have the stakes be very uh, rewarding so that mm -hmm. you're really encouraging their um, ability to share, get along in a defined, um, exciting game-like way. Okay, I like that. Raquel, your thoughts? I would agree. I mean, right, it's, it's pairing the act of enduring, what we call active ignoring, right? So unless there's safety concerns, nobody's like hitting each other, nothing's gonna fall on anyone. We're gonna actively ignore the behaviors we don't wanna see. We can still be keeping an, an eye, right? Um, but it, it doesn't look appealing to you in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> and then the, the second, literally the second in which like they're playing nicely, you praise the heck out of them. Um, and it, it's something that doesn't require you to buy anything, um, but it's the power of praise, right? And when it comes from parents, like that's, that's who kids want it most. There's also what we call related to label praise or something we call proximal praise, right? So I love how Susie is sitting at the table. She's eating her, you know, peas so nicely. Then sibling, other sibling might be like, hey, okay, let me get on, on that praise train over there. And so they might jump in with that. So just two, two very simple act of ignoring label praise, but they can take you a very, very long way. The other thing that I will share is if you were fortunate enough to, to be within a two-parent household um, I had a friend recently share that, you know, we're, we're in the middle of quarantine life. So a close friend of mine said her two daughters were, they love each other. They're, they're kids who, you know, do pretty well otherwise, but they were sick of each other. They were sick of seeing each other every day. It's their only playmate. So they decided both parents took one kiddo, took them either to opposite corners of the home and or went outside. So by the time they saw each other again, even though it was a small window of time relative to the many hours we're all spending together, um, it was enough breathing room to, to miss my sibling again. So that's just another sort of fun idea to play with. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Ayla. Well, listen, we're, we're coming sort of towards the end of our discussion. I just wanna make sure that one of the things that we address is you know, how to, how to, for parents to think about how to assess when things are actually more serious. And I'm just curious, in brief, you know, what are things that, that parents should look out for, for kids and especially teenagers that would make them think, okay, I should probably consult with a mental health professional. That's also a great question. So I, I think I would acknowledge that during this time, I mean, we need, we need to it's unprecedented times, it's, it's adverse times, some more so for some families, more so than others, and just really recognizing that. And when we're faced with these type of challenges for our kiddos who have reached certain developmental milestones, we might see some regression in that. So a very concrete example of that is a little one who's toilet trained, and now all of a sudden they're having accidents again, and they hadn't been for a very long time. Um, just recognizing that that might be related to the current state in which we're in. If that does not resolve itself within one or two weeks, um, that's cause for concern. So if we're seeing milestones that have been reached, step back, one or two weeks haven't resolved, continue to keep an eye on it. Um, more generally, if kids are becoming withdrawn 
like as, as formerly I think related to one of the questions were, but like on an excessive basis. Um, Laura, I don't know if you want to chime in with some other sort of red flags. I completely agree. I think changes in behavior that either suggest a regression or just, um, you know, a deviation in terms of sleep, uh, reactivity, mood, appetite, um, willingness to engage with friends or family. I think these can all be indicators of difficulties from a mental health um, perspective. And even more obviously, if, if kids or teens are talking about a huge uptick in anxiety or feeling really down or irritable or out of control, or you're seeing that in their behavior, um, then you know certainly trusting your instincts and keeping note of what you're seeing, asking them you know, very directly. We know that, you know, one of the most important um, supports that young people can have is parents who recognize changes and talk with them about it in a really open and safe um, way that shows that you accept, you know, no matter what's going on, that you're there to support and help your young person. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question because that's a really important um, topic that we haven't gotten to yet. Well, I think I the add... oh. No, go ahead, Raquel. Sorry, John. I was just going to say what I would add is um, sleep sleep routine, changes in eating. Um, so if, I mean, we're all sort of adjusting or hopefully have adjusted to, to some of that by, by now. I might still see some fluctuations in that. Um, but if it's, if it's persisting and it's just really disrupting their ability to stay focused in class beyond what's typical with life and is impacting everyone within the home, I think those are also key markers to, to seek out some help. Yeah, I just, I think, you know, what you guys are saying is so important, especially the piece that Laura, too, you mentioned about, you know, like one thing that we can all do as parents is pay close attention to any changes that our kids are experiencing and ask them um, and, you know, and asking them open-ended questions and, and don't take, I don't know, right? Like keep going, find different ways, um, you know, and there's so many different ways to ask a question and, you know, that often kids need their time. I find that a lot of that a lot of kids, they want to talk about it kind of late at night, like right before bedtime. So, you know, each kid has their own way of talking about it. And I think, you know, closing on that point that just being curious about our kids and asking them questions in a way that, you know, open a new questions as Laura um, and Raquel have been talking about. You guys, I want to thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I know so many parents got a lot out of this. Um, and that we're also going to help out HBO with some new subscriptions. Um, there he is. There's your, there's your <laughs> role the model scene. right That's there. <laughs> David is always clutch. Nice, uh, David. There's, there's the excellent parents uh, <laughs> right there. It's all about pizza. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming on. We really, really, really appreciate it. And uh, I will look forward to having you guys back on. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this discussion uh, with, with Dr. Perrett and, and uh, Dr. Kumba. We will be coming back next week and we will uh, be discussing, we'll be following up on more mental skills. So if some folks were asking questions about how to stay positive and hopeful, and we're going to be talking in detail about that topic. What are the mental skills that you can use as a parent, as someone at work, the same techniques and strategies that athletes use? Um, and talking uh, about that with a few of our expert mental skills coaches um, here that work with me with sports teams and firefighters, et cetera. So please join us next week. We'll be sending out some information on that. And you can check back out our website, www.unionsquarepractice.com. Um, you can reach out to uh, Raquel and, uh, and Laura on our site. If you have further questions for them, I'm sure they'd be happy to connect with you about other questions you might have about your kiddos. Until then, we wish you all health uh, and, and as much happiness as you can find in these, in these times. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much.